On World News Tonight. Off the grid. Undocumented Afghans go into hiding in Pakistan in fear of persecution, causing the assault. Israel agrees to daily humanitarian forces, all the while calling no ceasefires. Shots fired. Justin Trudeau condemns shootings targeting Jewish schools in Montreal. And Winter Wonderland. An ice rink at London's Battersea opens, instilling the early Christmas spirit. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Tonight we begin in Southeast Asia where unending violence continues to terrorize Myanmar. The United Nations has confirmed that about 90,000 people have been displaced in Myanmar due to the intensifying conflict between the country's military rulers and an alliance of ethnic armed groups. The UN body warned that disrupted transport, communications and other services were hindering humanitarian responses to the fighting. The violence has also raised concern in Beijing, which is putting pressure on the Myanmar military to crack down on crime in the border area. China maintains billions of dollars worth of energy infrastructure investments in the remote area of Myanmar. Beijing has, since the coup, continued to engage diplomatically with the military while also serving as one of its biggest arms suppliers. Jason Tower, Myanmar country director with the United States Institute of Peace, told media that China has shown a growing willingness to flex its muscles in influencing all of the actors involved in the revolution or the conflict in Myanmar. Meanwhile, the Chinese Foreign Ministry reiterated that China will ensure security and stability at its border with Myanmar and urged all parties to cease fighting. Many Afghans who fear persecution if they return to Afghanistan have gone into hiding in Pakistan. They try to avoid being detected by law enforcement agencies following a government policy to expel undocumented foreigners. After years of living in Pakistan, thousands of Afghans have gone into hiding. Rights activists say they are trying to escape a government order to expel undocumented foreigners, fearing persecution under the Taliban should they return to their homeland. A 23-year-old Afghan woman spoke to online from a shelter on condition of anonymity. She said dozens of others were also holed up there before moving on to a new hideout. The government of Pakistan, which started the deportation, the process has completely ruined the situation to such an extent that we are currently locked in our homes. We are currently living in a situation where we are inside the house, but we cannot turn on the electricity. The gate is locked from the outside. We are locked inside. We can't come out. We can't turn on our lights. We can't even talk loudly. Those at the shelter say the lock was put there by local supporters so neighbours believe the house is unoccupied and that some locals are helping the Afghans arrange for necessities to be smuggled into the shelter under the cover of night. The woman, who is from the Afghan capital of Kabul, worries she could be prosecuted if she returns. She converted from Islam to Christianity in 2019. Renunciation of the Islamic faith is a serious offence under the strict Islamic law practised by the Taliban. Authorities began rounding up migrants across the country after a deadline for voluntary exits expired on November 1st. The expulsion decision came after suicide bombings this year, which the government, without providing evidence, said involved Afghans. Islamabad has also blamed them for smuggling and other militant attacks. Karachi-based human rights activist Sijal Safiq helped vulnerable Afghans find shelter before Pakistan's new expulsion policy. She's one of several asking the Supreme Court to halt the deportation program. After uh, dreaming for the past uh, 15, 16 years that, oh, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, and suddenly be told that, no, you cannot have university education uh, anymore, you cannot have a profession, you cannot even go out in public. So that is taking everything away from some. So they, they, they say that they don't want, they rather die. So, and there are people who don't even have the choice, you know, for them, they, they cannot go because of their faith, they cannot go. 
They are the religious minority. They cannot. There was no immediate comment from the Taliban-run administration on whether those returning would face screening or prosecution under their laws. Saleh Zada, a 32-year-old singer in Karachi, said he moved from Afghanistan a year ago. He's fearful to return. My life was totally in danger. So because of this, I left all my dreams, I, all my things in Afghanistan. I left my families. Whatever I have actually job, I left my job and I just escaped from Afghanistan. Pakistan's foreign and interior ministries did not respond to requests for comment about exempting at-risk individuals from deportation. The government has so far brushed off calls from the international community to reconsider its expulsion plan or to identify and protect Afghans who face the risk of persecution at home. Over in Canada now, anti-Semitic acts are on the rise and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has condemned the recent violence targeting the Jewish community in the country. Canadian police are investigating shots fired at two Jewish schools in the city of Montreal overnight Wednesday. Amid what Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has described as a rise in anti-Semitism. On social media Thursday, Trudeau condemned the incidents at the schools as violent acts of anti-Semitism and called upon Canadians to stand united. Local media reported that both schools said they had found a bullet hole in their front doors when staff arrived Thursday morning. There were no injuries and it was not clear whether the incidents were linked. Montreal's mayor Valérie Plante spoke at a joint press conference with the city's police, the SPVM. This is not who we are here in Montreal. We will not accept it. Every violent and hateful event will be investigated by the SPVM which spares no efforts to keep our metropolis safe. Montreal's deputy police chief called for calm, quote, in view of the observed increase in tension and events related to the Middle East conflict on the territory. He said police would increase their visibility at places of worship and other key areas. In Toronto, police have reported hate crimes against Jews and Muslims have more than doubled the tally for all of 2022 in the three weeks after the initial Hamas attack in Israel on October 7th. Late Wednesday night, just hours before the shootings, reported a violent altercation at Concordia University in Montreal between people on opposing sides of the conflict in Israel and Gaza, resulting in injuries and an arrest. The White House says that Israel has agreed to pause military operations for four hours each day and open a second evacuation corridor from northern Gaza. This comes as Prime Minister Netanyahu once again asserted that no ceasefire will be considered until all hostages are released. The White House has said Israel has agreed to make daily four-hour humanitarian pauses in northern Gaza to enable civilians to find safe areas. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said Israel makes its own decisions, not the U.S., and there will be no military operations in the region during the pause. The Israeli military will announce each day's four-hour humanitarian pause and its location at least three hours in advance. Moreover, Kirby said Israel will open a coastal road as a second corridor for civilians heading south. According to the Israeli official on Thursday, after a first corridor along Gaza's main north-south highway was opened several times this week, more than 80,000 people used it to flee northern Gaza. However, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has stated that the humanitarian pauses are not a ceasefire and they could only come with the release of all hostages taken by Hamas. There will be no ceasefire without the release of our hostages. Anything else is futile. On the same day, Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari uploaded on social media that Israel's ground operation is ongoing in the military quarter, the main base of Hamas inside Gaza City. The IDF said Israeli infantry and armored units entered the zone to destroy Hamas facilities, killing around 50 Hamas members. They found tunnels and weapons facilities and discovered Hamas military bases and command centers. Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant said the IDF is developing new ways to enter or destroy tunnels without harming hostages and the fighting will not stop 
until all hostages are rescued safely. Latest updates on the road to the White House before the buzz of the third presidential debate dies down. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was out to prove at the Republican debate in Miami that Florida belongs to him, which was no easy task with Republican frontrunner Donald Trump just down the road in Florida, hosting his own rowdy rally, telling the world that Florida is Trump territory. Five candidates vying for the Republican presidential nomination sought to close the gap between themselves and frontrunner Donald Trump at the NBC News Republican presidential debate in Miami on Wednesday. The former president skipped the event in favor of a rally just a few miles away, which Florida Governor Ron DeSantis carefully swiped at. Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. Emory University political scientist Andrew Gillespie said DeSantis showed improvement on the stage this time. And he had a stronger debate performance in this debate than he'd had in the previous two debates. The question is whether it is enough to turn the momentum back in his favor. And I'm not sure that that is the case. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley also briefly criticized Trump. But she and the rest of the candidates spent much of the time attacking each other. Haley traded Barb several times with businessman Vivek Ramaswamy. Putin and President Xi are salivating at the thought that someone like that could become president. They would love to the see The fact that. of the matter is she doesn't answer so this the question. Is what I will tell she you. hit back hard and held her ground, which is something that's going to be really important. And I think that voters are going to remember. Gillespie called Ramaswamy a clear loser in the debate, along with U.S. Senator Tim Scott and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, whom she said looked like also rands. Gillespie said Trump, who leads opinion polls by a huge margin, would have to be convicted in one of his criminal trials to drop from first place or... It could also be that as these trials get underway, if there is some type of uh, smoking gun that comes out. So let's just say in Georgia, we hear one of the people who's already pleaded guilty um, on the stand and they say something that is particularly damaging and incriminating even before we get to, to President Trump's trial. I think if something like that were to happen, there may be some updating. The next debate takes place in December, less than six weeks before the first statewide nominating contest in Iowa. Welcome back. New guidelines given to Australian schools have introduced flexible schooling hours. These changes could include reducing and extending hours for a shorter school week. School will soon be out for summer, and when students return, learning life may be very different. It's certainly a way of the future, we think, in relation to education being as modern as the rest of lifestyles uh, and the way we live our lives these days. Innovative changes, including ditching the traditional nine to three school hours, even a radical transition to a four day week, are on the table. I'm encouraging and expecting students that they need to operate over the five days, but also if there's good ideas about flexibility in some cohorts, let's be more flexible for these students. The state government has given all schools guidelines on what is required to make make learning arrangements more flexible. There is now a very solid, consistent scrutiny that um, schools have to go through extensive consultation to be able to implement any changes. Changes can be made for various reasons, including the well-being of students and staff and as a means of addressing teacher and facility shortages. Corinda State High School is consulting parents and teachers about trialling a four-day week for seniors from next year. On the fifth day, students would be expected to work from home or attend TAFE. That's exactly what Leah Olson's son Nicholas did, giving him a taste of working life. Really positive. It gave him a good start into the trade that he wanted to go into and now he's able to be a first year apprentice. Other schools have already moved away from traditional schooling hours. On a Monday, the Gap State High's home time bell rings at 1.50. At Varsity College on the Gold Coast, school finishes at lunch 
on a Friday. We have the split shift stuff. We know that we have um, some schools that may start a little bit later in the mornings and some mornings or finish a little bit earlier one day a week. The fact that we're bringing in a little bit more consistency to support schools and their communities is actually a really good thing. The former head of Spain's centre-right People's Party in the Catalonia region, Alejo Vidal Codraz, was shot in the face. The scene took place in the wealthy Salamanca area of central Madrid. The former head of a conservative political party in Spain's Catalonia region is in stable condition after being shot in the face in Madrid. That's according to police who say they're hunting a gunman and an accomplice who pulled up near Alejo Vidal Cuadras on a motorcycle, shot him, then drove off. Police have not established a motive for the attack, but it comes at a politically tumultuous time for Spain. The day of the attack coincides with Spain's acting prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, clinching an amnesty deal with Catalan separatists that Vidal Cuadras's party called a, quote, total and irreversible humiliation. He used to lead the Catalan branch of the People's Party, which is on the center-right and opposes Sanchez's socialists. He's also a member of the far-right Vox Party. The amnesty deal is part of a wider power-sharing agreement made Thursday between the socialists and a separatist political party that could give Sanchez another term in office. It's been met with protests like these Wednesday night outside the Socialist Party headquarters. The amnesty deal could absolve as many as 1,400 separatist activists if it's approved by Congress. Prime Minister Sanchez expressed solidarity with Vidal Cuadras on social media and wished him a speedy recovery. Residents of Kenya's Gareza have been displaced and more than 300,000 people have been forced to flee their homes in Somalia amid heavy flooding that has inundated towns across East Africa. Kenya's Garissa is underwater. People here displaced from their homes amid the heavy rains that have inundated towns across East Africa. This is resident Abdallah Dulo. Our houses have been demolished, our farms are flooded, our chicken and goats have drowned. Our cooking pans, mattresses, seats, overall we've lost many things because of the floods. In Kenya, the floods have killed at least 15 people, according to the Kenya Red Cross. Red Cross Regional Coordinator Mohamed Abdul Qadir says the situation is dire. Uh, there is an urgent need for humanitarian support because there are displacement, there are areas which are cut off, and this is a rain that you know has rained uh, all over the, the region, not a specific place. Somalia's National Disaster Management Agency said on Wednesday that 29 people there had also died and more than 300,000 forced to flee their homes. The regional deluge has been caused by the combined effect of two weather phenomena, El Nino and the Indian Ocean Dipole, said Nazanin Mashiri, a climate analyst at the International Crisis Group. Those climate patterns impact ocean surface temperatures and cause above average rainfall. Portugal's President Marcelo Rebelo de Souza has dissolved Parliament and called snap elections, two days after the country's Prime Minister resigned amid a continuing corruption investigation. Portugal will hold a snap parliamentary election early next March, after its Prime Minister suddenly resigned this week amid a corruption scandal. The nation's President, Marcelo Rebelo de Souza, announced the vote on Thursday. I've been called to decide on the scenario created by the government, the consequence of the Prime Minister's resignation. I've decided for the dissolution of the parliament and called for elections on March 10, 2024. I tried to shorten the time for this decision as much as possible, and if it was not possible, to call elections to an earlier time. This has to do with the replacement of the leadership of the party in government. By law, elections must be held within 60 days after a presidential decree dissolving parliament has been published. D'Souza said he would disband parliament, where the Socialist Party has a majority, only after lawmakers hold a final vote on the 2024 budget bill by the end of November. 
He said it would meet the expectations of many Portuguese as the budget includes lower income tax rates for the middle class, social benefits, and help deploy EU recovery funds and projects, measures that can help spur Portugal's slowing economic growth. Portugal's Prime Minister António Costa stepped down after his staff were suspected in a widespread corruption probe. His majority socialist administration is accused of improperly handling lithium mining and hydrogen projects in the country. His government has also been criticized for failing to do enough to tackle the cost of living crisis and soaring housing prices fueled by incentives to lure wealthy foreigners to the country. Welcome back. U.S. top diplomat Antony Blinken arrived in India for bilateral talks. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world. In U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in New Delhi today ahead of talks in India. The officials say they will focus on security challenges in the Indo-Pacific and concerns over China. Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin discussed the war in Ukraine with his military top brass. The Defense Minister and Chief of the General Staff also attended the discussion. AstraZeneca raised its annual earnings forecast, helped by strong demand for its cancer drugs, and moved to boost its pipeline, booming anti-obesity market with a deal costing up to two billion dollars. South Korea has ramped up pest control measures and inspections to prevent the spread of bed bugs after reports of suspected infestations at some saunas and residential facilities. Colombia's National Liberation Army has freed the father of Liverpool soccer player Luis Diaz. He has been released after being taken hostage nearly two weeks ago. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again next week as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in the UK as the London Battersea Power Station marked the opening of its popular festive ice rink, Glide, with an evening for invited guests. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.